Hi, this is Mike Lacona, the North American Mission Board. I have the privilege today of interviewing Jay Richards, who is a philosopher of science at the Discovery Institute in Seattle, Washington. Uh, Jay is co-author with Guillermo Gonzalez of the book The Privileged Planet, a uh, book several years ago that, with the video, had some attention with the journal put out by the Smithsonian Institution. And we're just happy to have him on the phone today. Thanks, Jay, for joining us. Hey, my pleasure, Mike. Great to be with you. Jay, I uh, want to talk about Stephen Hawking's new book called The Grand Design, which mm -hmm. was co-authored by Leonard. Can you pronounce that last name for us? It's, it's Mladenow, but it's a Russian name. It starts M-L, so it's very hard to pronounce in English. Mladenow. Okay, Mladenow, um, who teaches at UCLA, correct? Uh, or Caltech, I believe. Caltech, okay. Uh, just published by Bantam. And uh, Stephen Hawking, so both of these guys have some very interesting to, things to say that have uh, raised some eyebrows within the scientific community. First of all, who is Stephen Hawking? Most people probably recognize the name Stephen Hawking, but he's, he's a famous mathematician and physicist that actually until last October, he held the Lucasian Chair of Mathematics at Cambridge University. This is the same chair that Sir Isaac Newton held a few hundred years ago. So obviously his academic standing uh, is quite high, but he's had a couple of very well-known documentaries on PBS and a, and a best-selling book a uh, you know, decade or two ago called The Brief History of Time, which most people have on their copy tables, but unfortunately I don't think most people have read it. Uh, this new book, though, um, is getting a lot of coverage, uh, The Grand Design, in which he tries to answer some of the questions he's asked in the past, but, uh, but also address and, he thinks, I think, solve some of the perennial questions of philosophy and to do it as a physicist. Wow. Well, what is Hawking claiming in his new book? Well, it's funny because Hawking back in the 1970s actually proved a set of equations with another mathematician named Roger Penrose. And uh, he essentially showed that if Einstein's theory of general relativity holds, then the universe must begin in a so-called singularity. In other words, if you sort of uh, extrapolate back the history of the cosmos, you'll reach a point at some point in the finite past in which all the matter and energy in the universe basically collapse down to a point of infinite density and zero volume. So basically just a beginning point in the past. And this is still what he's best known for uh, as an academic uh, physicist. But it's funny because almost his entire sort of popular career in writing popular books has been one that's transfixed by the idea of God. In his, in his book, A uh, Brief History of Time, he actually sort of punts on the question of God. He talks about the laws of physics and says, well, this is interesting. We may be reaching a, a uh, a point in which we can describe everything in the physical universe very well, but still we don't know, you know, who breathes fire into the equations. And so he, you know, it sort of ambiguously talks about God. You get the impression he's using God in a metaphorical sense. But ironically, I mean, he's a scientist who helped prove that if Einstein's theory of general relativity is true, the universe had to have had a beginning. And so, um, you know, a lot of us think that's very sort of God-friendly in terms of ideas. If the universe had a beginning, it's likely the universe had a cause outside itself. And so Hawking has been playing with the idea of God for decades, but it's really in this most recent book, The Grand Design, that I think he has the fundamental answer, what he thinks is sort of the final answer, and he appeals uh, to some, some very arcane uh, physics, and in fact, some highly speculative physics, such as so-called M-theory, to basically argue, as he's been quoted uh, in many newspapers, that the universe, because the laws of physics are a certain way, the universe, as he's quoted saying, can create itself spontaneously from nothing. So in other words, the universe doesn't need a, a cause for its existence. It doesn't need God to do the creating because somehow it can explain itself. Hmm. Now, so Hawking does believe that the universe had a beginning. He does, and that's the that's the sort of troubling point, is that he, we can no longer sort of sustain the so-called steady-state theory of the universe, or the, uh, just a, a view that they had in the 19th century, which is that the universe was eternal. You know, Hawking accepts the evidence that the universe had a beginning, and so the question is, okay, what do you do with a universe that has a beginning if you don't want to be a theist, or you don't want to at least appeal to something outside the universe to cause it? And so that's what he's trying to pull off, is, is there a way the universe can sort of bootstrap itself into existence. So yeah, he definitely believes in a, a beginning. Jay, do the majority of 
cosmologists or astrophysicists, do they believe that the universe had a beginning? They do. And in fact, this is, I mean, one of the, the least controversial claims that you could make in physics or cosmology is that the universe, it has an age. I mean, all you have to do is turn on PBS. Any documentary about the universe is going to state some age for the universe. The only thing that has an actual age, right, is it's finite in the past. And so or my view is that this is, is at least troubling to materialists. And so it makes sense that uh, really smart people that are committed to a materialist worldview are going to look for ways to try to either explain this or explain it away. Um, and they don't do it anymore by somehow claiming the universe is eternal. The sort of uh, explanation of choice is some version of a multiverse theory or a world ensemble theory. In other words, it's the, the idea that our universe is just one of a vast array of other universes, maybe an infinite variety, and this is just the one that we uh, happen to inhabit, that's Hawking's uh, proposal. And he proposes some very complicated things using quantum physics and a particular way of interpreting quantum physics, plus multiverse ideas. Uh, but that by itself is not the most interesting point. It's that Hawking actually thinks uh, it's not just that our universe is one of a, of a vast array of, of other universes, but that somehow the laws of physics themselves uh, will create the universe out of nothing. That's, a, that's a, at the very least, a very counterintuitive claim. Well, are these new arguments that Hawking is making? You know, they're not really. I mean, the so-called M-theory is fairly new in the last decade or decade and a half, I suppose. But um, for a few decades, there have been some physicists that have pro proposed something called string theory, which just basically claims that the fundamental constituents of, of the universe are not atoms that are little tiny points, but they're these strings that just have a single dimension, like a line in geometry. And the problem is, is there are several versions of string theory, a, a set of equations that were developed by some physicists. Other physicists found, well, these can be solved in lots of different ways. So you get this proliferation of so-called M theories or string theories that uh, then some physicists have tried to unify. And that's what M theory is. M theory is an attempt to unify theories from quantum physics and various string physics into kind of uh, a theory of everything. But Hawking himself has talked about these things in a, in a few previous books. And so um, despite, you know, the, the headlines uh, that have been uh, seen around the world, Hawking isn't actually proposing anything new on the scientific front. In fact, he's appealing to these same very highly speculative ideas that physics have been, physicists have been talking about for a few decades. Interesting. Well, what are the problems with this argument? Well, you know, anyone, if you just sort of Google Hawking in his book, The, the Grand Design, you'll pull up a news story that has quotes Hawking saying that given the laws of physics, the fact that we have a particular law of gravity, uh, we don't need a creator because the universe will, uh, will create itself spontaneously out of nothing. Now, you know, this ought to strike people as very strange. I'm surprised that very few media figures have, have challenged Hawking on this because what he's saying is that laws, like the law of gravity, which describes, you know, the, uh, the way in which matter interacts at certain uh, size scales, so the reason that our planets sort of adhere in these orbits around the, the sun, we refer to that as the law of gravity. But the physical laws are mathematical descriptions about, you know, what physical objects do. Uh, they're not causal agents. We don't, you know, refer to the law of gravity as something an entity that can bring other things into existence. It's a description of the kind of regularities that we observe in the physical universe. And so Hawking, um, ironically, I mean, at the beginning of his book, the first page, he says, philosophy is dead. Uh, but unfortunately, he makes one of the most simple philosophical blunders here. He's making a, what's called a category error. He is confusing physical laws, which, you know, describe the way matter interacts in a certain way, with agents or with causes, things that can cause other things to come into existence. And so, um, you know, even John Lennox, for instance, who is a Christian and a mathematician at Oxford University, pointed this out in an op-ed. Uh, he, he said, look, you know, Hawking's just making a basic confusion here because it would make sense to say that an intelligent agent could specify what the laws of physics are going to be and then create a universe like that. Now, if you're an atheist, you might not believe that, but it makes sense. You're talking about a causal agent. You're talking about God. It doesn't even really make a lot of sense to say that the law of gravity uh, – causes the universe to exist, because the, the law of gravity is one of the things in the physical universe we're trying to explain. And so there's a sense almost in which Hawking's claim isn't even really grammatical, and yet because of his intellectual stature and the, the fact that I think he's proposing 
uh, a materialistic theory, which tends not to get challenged, no one is really thinking about what he's saying or how perplexing and strange it is. In other words, it, it seems that there are metaphysical problems with what he's saying, but no one's challenging him because, like you said, his intellectual stature, they're thinking, well, there must he, he – He's holding this, so it must not be the problem that it apparently is. Well, that's exactly right. And I, frankly, I think this happens a lot, Mike, when physicists speak, because, you know, 99 out of 100 of us are not theoretical physicists. We know that physicists talk about very complicated and obscure things all the time. And so when somebody says something of the stature of Stephen Hawking, if you stop and think about it, most people might think, huh, that doesn't really make any sense. In fact, it doesn't seem to be intelligible. But most people are intimidated and don't just say that. They don't say, well, I know you're, you're smart and everything, but that doesn't make any sense. Can you at least explain it to me so that it would make some sense? And uh, unfortunately, too many physicists, I think, are getting a free pass on that kind of common sense litmus test that the rest of us have to pass. Sure, physicists talk about very complicated and technical things, but they ought to be able to explain these ideas in a way that, that makes some basic sense and doesn't you know, violate uh, simple sort of logical rules. Well, Jay, you've argued that the evidence from physics and cosmology has actually been going against atheism for about a century. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is that if you look at the evidence we've talked about here briefly and you compare it with the alternatives, I think the evidence of physics and cosmology is, if it doesn't sort of prove the existence of God, it's at least the sort of thing that you would expect if you believed in God. A lot of people don't know, but in the 19th century, the vast majority of scientists assumed uh, as a sort of first rule of science that the universe was eternal. It had always existed. In fact, even as late as the 1930s, many scientists said, asking where the universe came from or why it's here is not a scientific question. We simply can't answer that. Uh, and yet starting in the 1920s, uh, Edwin Hubble, uh, using a, a telescope in California, uh, discovered something called the, the cosmic or galactic redshift, in which it appeared that, that uh, distant galaxies uh, were expanding away from us. We're moving away from us in every direction. That suggested that the universe, you know, if it's expanding in every direction, you, if you work cosmic history backward, it would mean that everything would, uh, would congeal and at some point would congeal into a, to a single point. So that very quickly suggested to people that the universe must have had a beginning. Now, it wasn't a really popular idea for obvious reasons, because um, if, you know, the materialist intuition is going to be to say we've got to have a, a universal or a, an eternal universe, because for the materialist, matter is the fundamental reality, and whatever your fundamental reality is, it's going to have to be eternal because it doesn't make sense to talk about things creating themselves out of nothing if they don't exist. Well, as long as you could assume the material universe was eternal, you didn't have to address the question of where it came from. Uh, but starting with Hubble's discoveries of the, the expanding universe, and then 1960s, we had a discovery of the cosmic background radiation, which was itself evidence for a beginning. Uh, physicists were suddenly confronted with the reality that you had a universe with a finite age and a past and a beginning. So now you can't just assume its existence. You can say, look, if it had a beginning, um, things that begin to exist can't be the cause for their existence. Um, and so if the universe began to exist, and almost by you know, sort of logical rules, it must have had a cause for itself outside the universe. That is a cause that transcends the universe. And so a lot of physicists, a lot of scientists actually uh, admitted, starting in the 1960s, that um, you know, the best interpretation of this is theistic. So, for instance, even Arno Penzias, who is the co-discoverer of the cosmic background radiation, he's Jewish, and he points to this evidence as evidence for the existence of God. Now, that's just the evidence for a beginning. I haven't even mentioned a couple of the other sort of classes of evidence. One is the so-called fine-tuning of the constants and laws of physics. The idea of fine-tuning is just that the, the laws and constants that, that sort of govern our universe, the law of gravity, the electromagnetic force that holds atoms together, all those things look like they're very precisely fine-tuned, as if they're on a razor's edge, so that if any of them were even slightly different, slightly stronger, slightly weaker, they had different values, a universe with life in it couldn't possibly exist. That is called the fine-tuning problem in physics. And, and for a lot of people, if the universe looks fine-tuned, well, surely maybe it's because it is fine-tuned. And finally, the evidence that Guillermo Gonzalez and I talk about in The Privileged Planet, that even in a very fine-tuned universe, you still got to get a whole lot of other things to go right locally, the right kind of planet with the right kind of atmosphere around the right kind of star, with the moon and the right kind of galaxy, and the right location in the galaxy, all these things. 
um, a, a sort of higher degree of fine tuning. But what's really interesting is that, that we discovered, talk about in the privileged planet, that all those things you need to, to fine tune an environment for life, like we have on the Earth, also provide the best setting for scientific discovery. So in other words, in our universe, those very rare places set up for observers are the best places for observing. Well, that's just what you would expect if you think the universe was, was designed in part for scientific discovery, for discovering the world around us. That doesn't make any sense in a materialist worldview. And so that's why I say, really, for the better part of the last century, the evidence has been going against the materialist worldview and has been going toward uh, at least a theistic worldview. Wow. Well, now, how, how do evidence, how, how do atheists respond in light of this evidence? Well, initially, the response was to try to propose alternative theories. So after Hubble made his discoveries uh, of an expanding universe, which, by the way, were essentially predicted by Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity, Einstein himself resisted it at first. He actually added a variable to his general relativity equations to try to avoid an expanding universe. Later realized and called it the greatest blunder of his scientific career. Uh, but there are other scientists that propose a so-called steady state theory of the universe in which the universe is expanding, but expanding space itself would sort of spontaneously give rise uh, to new matter. But with the discovery of the cosmic background radiation and a few other things in the 1960s, the steady state theories died. Uh, so then you're thinking, okay, well, what do we do now? So we have a universe with a beginning. Um, well, what you do is you propose that, okay, it would be suspicious if our universe fine-tuned for life with a beginning was the only one that existed. But what if there's this vast ensemble of universes? There's some way in which universes come into existence. Ours is just one. Maybe that process has been going on for eternity. We just happen to be in the one that's fine-tuned for life. And so, of course, that's the one we observe. Uh, but in other words, it's, it's basically a selection effect. It's only because we happen to be in the universe that uh, is fine-tuned for life that we're able to observe it. But since there's a vast array, we shouldn't be surprised that any one particular universe exists. And this is really where all the action is now. It's between people that want to propose multi-universes and then those that are critics of that idea for one sort or another. Jay, are there anyone that you know of, any scientist who still embrace the steady state theory? None that I know of. I mean, in some ways, I think that these multiverse theories are a, a kind of a different version of that. Uh, but the vast majority of, of physicists and cosmologists accept uh, what is, you know, kind of euphemistically called the Big Bang cosmology. But that doesn't mean the universe began with an explosion. It's actually a pejorative term that a steady state theorist named Fred Hoyle actually came up with. But the general view is that, okay, our universe began in the finite past. There was an initial period in which it was very hot and very dense, and then it's uh, still expanding from that initial event. Uh, the only question is, okay, is this the only universe that exists, or are there lots of universes? And that's almost the in, describes almost the entire debate. There might be half a dozen um, dissenters from that, but it's it's remarkable how the, the general outlines there are well agreed upon. What about the old oscillating universe hypothesis that you had this expand, contract, expand, expand contract, and that just yeah. continues to do that? Does anyone That's, hold that any longer? They hold versions of that. There, there were problems with that original oscillating universe model, which, I mean, really, you can sort of understand it intuitively. If you have this process of a universe that contracts and re-expands, and it's been going on from eternity, uh, well, basic sort of rules of thermodynamics would mean that the sort of amount of available energy and order that you have from the beginning would be winding down. So you'd have sort of less uh, order and more disorder in every new oscillation. But if every one of these this has been going on from eternity, then we should have reached a state of, <laughs> of absolute equilibrium an infinite amount of time ago. And that's a sort of problem. And those are the problems you get when you play with these infinite series. And so most physicists now, they, you, they'll speak sort of that way, but they tend to think more uh, in terms of an, an ensemble of universes that exist sort of simultaneously. And so there's some kind of process that's giving rise to uh, universes continually, but they don't tend to think of it as just a single linear sequence of one universe itself oscillating back and forth, but rather new universes coming into existence all the time. Well, tell me if I'm understanding you accurately. It seems to me you're saying that there are two major positions held by scientists and physicists today. One is that what we see with the appearance of fine-tuning in the universe suggests 
a theistic reality, that the universe was created by some sort of designer, an intelligent designer. The other view is the multiverse view, saying that there are uh, just tons, an uncountable number of universes that are existing simultaneously, and we just happen to be in the one where the laws are friendly toward life. Is is that a fair uh, summary of your assessment of where scientists are today? I would say that's a fair assessment of the kind of two broad options, but you know, individual scientists end up all over the place. And so there are a lot of scientists that accept that and really think ours is the only universe, but they don't want to go with the theistic implications. And so they just sort of stay agnostic about it. Then there's a, some of those that say, well, look, this, if there's any evidence of theism, this would be it. And they're happy to go that way. Um, and then there's this other set m- widely covered in the media who are trying to develop theoretical apparatuses to be able to create these vast ensembles of universes. And these are a lot of really smart guys, but I think it's important to realize that one of the main motivations for this is to get around uh, the basically theistic implications of the evidence of physics. And I think we ought to just openly admit that. That that was what was admitted in the 1930s. A lot of physicists that didn't like a a beginning, they said we don't like it precisely because it implies that there's a God, and they, they resisted that. No one could have predicted that this would happen. It's not as if in you know, in, in 1901, someone predicted that this evidence was going to suddenly appear. This was the natural world itself disclosing new information that, that nobody had ever known before. Uh, and if you really look at the evidence and, and try to you know, get around a lot of the, the theorist posturing, I, I think just simply based on the scientific evidence, that the idea of a transcendent God has is, is never been in better shape. So would you say then, that, Jade, does this all boil down to worldview? Is this actually a scientific uh, debate that's going on, or is it a philosophical or theological debate? I would say it's both. Uh, And in fact, you know, whenever you're talking about origins, the origin of life, the origin of the universe, uh, you're talking about issues that are at the boundary between what we might think of as philosophy or theology and what we might think of as science. Um, and what we've got to look out for is these attempts to sort of dictate where the boundaries are going to go. So, for instance, these guys that are proposing multiverses, I mean, there's nothing more speculative than this. In fact, Roger Penrose a couple of weeks ago uh, reviewed Hawking's book and said there's no observational evidence whatsoever for M-theory. Um, nevertheless, if somebody is proposing a materialistic theory, it will often get treated as science. And so, in other words, well, then it ought to be a subject of public debate. But if somebody proposes, say, intelligent design, the universe looks like it was designed, that gets consigned to philosophy or theology. Now, I like philosophy and theology, but when people do that rhetorically, what they're saying is that, well, the idea that the universe is designed, that's just based on your private sort of subjective opinions, whereas these materialistic you know, theories, they're based on the evidence. No, what we're doing is we're debating the same set of evidence, and we're debating different ways of interpreting that evidence. And so I, I would say it doesn't come down to worldview in the sense that the, our worldviews don't dictate what reality is like, but our worldviews do shape what kinds of ideas we're willing to entertain. The theist, uh, the person that believes in God, is open to uh, a sort of wider set of possibilities. We're happy to look at you know, the evidence for various kind of uh, material and law-like explanations, but we're also open to the possibility of evidence for design. And I think because of that, we're, we're looking at the evidence quite clearly, and we're understanding where its implications are. I think where we are now is that materialists are working with a set of blinders on their minds and their eyes so that they're not willing uh, even to perceive or to entertain the possibility that the universe points beyond itself. And so this is a is sort of a perfect clash of uh, an interpretation of the same set of evidence by two fundamentally different worldviews. So worldviews then, is, is that the reason why there is such resistance to considering what seems obvious to so many of us, that the universe is intelligently designed? I do think it comes down to that. I mean, Paul tells us in Romans 1.20, right? He says, from the foundation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen so that men were without excuse. But then he goes on to say, but although they know and loved God, men worshipped and served the created things. In other words, 
the created order, for its part, is like God's general revelation. It testifies to God's existence. But human beings in our sin cast our gaze downward so that we don't look at the evidence clearly. In fact, we sort of focus on the creation itself rather than focusing on considering the possibility that it points to a creator. Uh, and because of sin, you know, this is what philosophers call the noetic effects of sin. It affects what we're willing to entertain and even know. Um, but we have to always remember that what we want to do is we want to be open to the book of nature. We want to be open to the evidence of nature to see where it's really pointing to. Um, and unfortunately, that, you know, that leads to these debates. But I am always optimistic. I believe that you know, God bestows his grace upon uh, believers and unbelievers alike. And I think that as long as we focus squarely on these evidences, uh, that it's a very good time to, to believe in God. So when you talk about evidences, let's say, uh, and with Hawking is saying here, would you say that the problems involved in his hypothesis are mortal to it, that it kills it, or does it just render it improbable? I, I would say at least the way Hawking is proposing it, it kills it, because, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that he, he says that because the laws of physics are what they are, the universe creates itself spontaneously out of nothing. Well, you know, one of the most fundamental rules of reasoning is that from nothing, nothing comes. I mean, it doesn't even, what, if you just think about this, what does it mean to say that something doesn't exist or nothing exists and then suddenly it causes itself to exist? But you're saying nothing exists, so there's nothing there to, to cause anything to come into existence. Uh, it, it, you know, it's like putting... Uh, contradicting the law of non-contradiction uh, in the very first premise of an argument. I mean, if you can do that, that means, you know, you learn this in first logic class. If you allow the uh, contradiction the law of non-contradiction, you can prove absolutely anything. And, you know, if things can pop into existence um, or cause themselves to come into existence out of nothing, then, you know, no matter what happens, you could explain it away, right? So a detective could go into a murder scene and maybe someone's been killed with a knife in their back in the kitchen, somebody might say, well, we need to look for a murderer, you know, and the detective could say, well, no, I mean, if the universe can cause itself to come into existence out of nothing, maybe the knife could too, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, it's really ludicrous, it's only because really smart physicists say these things that we spend even a moment with them, um, and that's what Hawking is, is quoted as saying, now, if you read Hawking's book, he's not meaning that when he says nothing. He uses the word nothing, but he actually uses it to refer to something. And what he's referring to is these certain kind of uh, quantum vacuum states in which matter can come into existence and go back out of existence. But those are very specific, uh, you know, spatial uh, realities that have particular properties and particular laws. It's not nothing. What he, he's sort of he's claiming uh, unwittingly is that from something, something else comes, and we could debate that. Uh, but as he's proposing his theory, the universe creates itself out of nothing. I, I think it's dead on the water because it just simply violates the laws of logic uh, quite apart from uh, the physics itself. And I think it's just really important for us to recognize that because I think this is in some ways an act of desperation on the part of a materialist because uh, in the face of evidence the universe had a beginning you either say well something caused it to exist that was this way which is the kind of reasoning we we uh, participate in every day or you say it bootstrapped itself uh, into existence from nothing even when it didn't exist now, those are really stark alternatives and if that's the best the materialist can come up with and i think uh, as theists we're in pretty good shape I've heard at times, Jay, some say that the universe, there's a good chance it could have come into existence out of nothing because of some of the results, some of the things that have been discovered in light of quantum mechanics, where you have subatomic particles that come in and out of existence simultaneously. How would you respond to that? Well, you know, when you're, let, let's just sort of take the quantum physics on face value. You certainly do, you know, there's lots of weird stuff when you're doing quantum physics. We're dealing with the science of the very, very, very small. And so there's always just the possibility that our way of measuring these things is incomplete. Uh, but let's say particles can come into existence and go out of existence. When they're doing that, they're not coming into existence out of nothing. They're in particular sort of quantum fields in particular locations in which you have various forces and laws. Uh, and so, again, they're, it, they're talking about individual particles in a larger system that would come into existence and then baby back out. There's nothing philosophically problematic about that because you've got a, something there to begin with. The problem is when you try to claim that the universe as a whole, you know, or everything 
came into existence out of nothing. That's a completely different claim because the claim is that uh, there aren't any other, there aren't any pre-existing conditions that could give rise to that. So what we really have is these very weird kind of special cases in quantum physics being extrapolated to the entire universe when they're completely different situations. Now, what would you say to the person who thinks that the arguments are totally inconclusive and that, say, multiple universes is just as good an explanation as intelligent design? Well, this is what I deal with a lot because I talk about this issue on university campuses and things like that. And usually people will say, okay, I admit, you know, it can kind of go either way. But it looks like it's just a stalemate. But I think it's important to, to, to realize that you've got to think, okay, what's going to count as a good explanation beforehand, you know? I mean, just because there are competitors in, you know, arguments about an issue, it doesn't mean that the competitors are, are equals or that they're equally matched. And think about the multiverse explanation. I mean, it's, it competes with intelligent design. So the intelligent design theorist says the universe has the very properties that we would expect if it were intelligently designed. It's the sort of thing that you know, foreknowledge could have. If an agent had foresight and would know what kind of properties it would need to have to be able to have life, I could create this kind of universe. That's the design explanation. The multiverse explanation is that, okay, well, it looks designed, but that's only an artifact of the fact that we're just seeing this little part of the multiverse. But in fact, there's this vast ensemble of universes which function to kind of explain the appearance of design away. Again, the, the multiverse theorist is using reasoning that we would immediately discount in any other circumstance. So, you know, take the illustration I had a minute ago of the murder scene with the knife in the back, right? Uh, now, you know, one detective might say, okay, this looks like, you know, the sort of thing that could get set up. As it turns out, this woman who was murdered here, her husband, you know, took out a million-dollar insurance policy last month, and he's fleed the country. That looks like we might be dealing with, with a homicide. And the other detective says, well, no, wait. Maybe there are trillions and trillions of scenes like this going on around the universe or in different universes, and in some of those, knives appear or drop from the sky, right, or sort of spontaneously fly across the room, and maybe we're just in one of those universes. I mean, you see the problem. It completely destroys practical reasoning uh, if you can just sort of inflate these other scenarios to get around what is manifestly evidence for design, and I think that's what we're dealing with here. What we have is the evidence of one universe uh, with a beginning that's been highly fine-tuned, not only for life, but for scientific discovery, that looks manifestly like intelligent design. And I don't think just sort of, you know, uh, postulating these other universes is a really good explanation. I think, if anything, that's an attempt to explain the evidence away. And it's a kind of desperation on the part of a materialist. And that the materialist would never even ex uh, accept his own kind of reasoning in any other scenario. So the materialist will reject... God or an intelligent designer as a possible cause because it's not detectable by science. But yet when it comes to multiverses, we'll posit that we're in one of a countless number of uh, universes that exist, coexist simultaneously, and yet they'll say that's science. Is that correct? That's correct, and it's because one is, uh, you know, an, an appeals to an agent or is specifically theological, and the other appeals to just something that's matter. And if you think only appeals to matter count as scientific, you're going to think that. But, you know, we appeal to the activities of intelligent agency every day. I mean, we never see an agent directly. You can't put my, you know, can't put me as an agent under a microscope or a telescope, but you see the effects of intelligent agency by its effects in the world. And that's an ordinary type of reasoning. Materialists and theists and Christians and Jews use that kind of reasoning every day. And I think if you just allow uh, for the possibility that there are effects of intelligence in the, the physical universe that we could discover and then allow people to make that inference, I think it, it leads to the conclusion of intelligent design quite naturally. Wow. Jay, what kind of things are you working on right now? Well, I recently wrote a book on uh, theology and economics called Money, Greed, and God, and so I'm spending a whole lot of time on that. But I also have a book just about to come out uh, called God and Evolution about the so-called theistic evolution debate, which is an attempt to, to wed mo uh, some form of theism with Darwinian evolution. It's called God and Evolution. Actually, it comes out in just a couple of weeks. Wonderful. Jay, if someone listening would like to contact you to have you come speak to their group, uh, just to find out information, how to get you there, what kind of honorarium or fee you require, how can they uh, get in touch with you? Uh, they just just send an email uh, at the Discovery Institute website, and you can check out the Discovery Institute website at discovery.org. 
Thank you, Jay. Appreciate you uh, joining us today. Ladies and gentlemen, Jay Richards. Check out his books, and thank you, Jay, for joining us. My pleasure, Mike.